Hi everyone. Welcome to witness the beginnings of a 15 year long friendship. Today <laughs> we are really <laughs> discussing <laughs> The Forever War, which is the first book in the science fiction masterwork series. We are reading these one at a time unless they are over 300 pages long in which we do consider breaking it up into multiple discussions. Um, there are over 160 of these, so it's going to take us about 15 years to get through them. <laughs> so <laughs> most long-term friendships get to say, uh, oh, can you believe it? We've been friends for so long. Today, we have the exclusive privilege of saying, can you believe it? <laughs> we get to be friends for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the booktube community's version of Survivor, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Five started. How many remain? Yeah. None remain. We just had a joke last week about how at some point we might make a video about the divorce. So <laughs> we'll still make content because every year we have to talk about what happened that one That's true. time. That's true. <laughs> So with that, over to my friends. Jared, would you like to start us off with introductions? Oh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jared. I have the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel. Um, uh, kind of a weekend warrior thing for me. And um, and I uh, also haunt the uh, page chewing forums, which is fun. Is it me? Yeah. Oh, um, so my name is Susanna. And I write weird fantasy. And you have a channel? Uh, yes, I have a channel. It's a, a week old. Uh, only has two videos. But yeah, it's called Den of the Weird. Yes, go check it out. We had an awesome live stream on it. And I think Susanna made a video recently as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Leila. I'm Leila Koshi. I, um... I'm a reader and writer, and uh, I have a site called Velody Magazine, kind of been on hiatus during the summer, but got some things lined up for late August and fall. So yeah, I'm looking forward to discussing this. Nice. Uh, and my name is Chris Mullen, sometimes booktuber, sometimes appear in other people's channels, discussing great books, movies, whatever there is to discuss. And uh, am I, the only person that this is a reread for, or has anybody read this before? I have not. First time. So this is a reread for me. Nice. Oh, okay. And what I will say in general about that is, my brain only thought that the book was about the last thirty pages. <laughs> 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 my memory of the entire novel from start to finish, how good it was, how bad it was, was all pretty much what was in the last mm. thirty pages. Everything before yeah. that is sort of not there. <laughs> it does it does come together a lot in the last 30 pages mm. yeah mm -hmm. and and also when the action started in the last 30 pages i was surprised because i didn't think there was enough room to wrap up everything Indeed, that yeah. it said but it, it worked um mm -hmm. yeah what did everyone else think <laughs> Well, first i just wanted to say about the 15 years i think if we <laughs> You know, if we use whatever that leap, I forget the their term the terminology for it, but you know, we could cover a lot of Earth years if we were having a discussion <laughs> on you know yeah. one of the, the what the Taran uh, planet or whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I um, I really liked how uh, the the futuristic topics he brought up. Uh, especially in the U.S., seem to, I mean, there's some correlations to discuss, you know, and I really sure. like that, which I know we can get into, but as a broad comment, I did think of The Expanse. I, I was comparing it to The Expanse, and I wondered if some nods to it uh, were in The Expanse novels, um, and the only thing that that kind of stuck out to me, um, whatever planet they first went out to, and I forget the name of it, but um, they said something about the sun being a dim light, you know, but now we know if you even go past Saturn, the sun is like this little dot, you know, so, so that was just a little thing, but, um, you know, otherwise I thought there's some very prescient uh, situations and uh, really fascinating, 
-hmm. Yeah, I mean the strongest. I wonder... Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just. I, I wonder how the author feels about getting so many things right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I worry how much he might still get right by the end of the decade. Um, you know, yeah. It was quite a surprise for me. This book has been my TBR for years and years. And uh, I think it was the perfect mob, the perfect time to read it. I was not prepared. I thought it was something completely different. Uh, so yeah, really enjoy it. Yeah, he. Um, I thought like the one of the biggest themes in the book was how he tied the big war into the economy, and how that war was kind of needed to keep the economy going for such a long time. I mean, how, how many years was it? Thousands, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, that was so relevant to not only the time he wrote it during Vietnam, but also today. Um, our military, even before Vietnam, our military industrial complex here in the United States is um, something that I see firsthand. I work kind of in the industry. My in my job works for the the industry and it's um, and it's something that's to almost self perpetuating all the time, like it feeds itself and it keeps and it just keeps going and you wonder not only in the wars that the United States is involved in, but in all the wars that are going on on the planet, this, the war, the wars are that tied into the economies. And uh, I thought that was the thing that he brought forth very strongly in this book. It's interesting because this isn't when we talk, we were talking about, you know, the, these are classic sci-fi books. This is 1974. I mean, this is sort of a bit later than a lot of people envisage classic sci-fi to be. Yet, it's still a couple of years after the moon land. It's still pre-Voyager probe getting sent out into space. You know, it, it finds this little window of time where not an awful lot of stuff has happened in terms of development of space technology. And yet, obviously very much in the media and the news and yet he's taken a common event that he was party to obviously the vietnam war and his own experiences and kind of tied those two and messed them together and created i would say a strange book because i would say if you're a character only reader this is a book that will not really work for you because you have a main protagonist and a character that's one very bland gray there's nothing exceptional about him, aside from his high IQ that's given at the start to the fact that he conscripted all these smart people in. And that also is somebody that has no effect on the world. Do you know what I mean? He, he exists in this one, he gets moved around from place to place, but no matter what he goes to do, he has literally no effect on the novel, or rather than to be a bystander and tell us about it. So, in that case, you're not getting an awful lot of character development other than the chapters of his life as he makes his way up through ranks, through basically no other reason than longevity. Uh, it's literally the only thing that happens there, but yet the book is still structured in terms of his military career from start to finish. And all of those things, I think, make for a really interesting premise with which to set the book. And then you put on, as Jared and a couple of others have said, these kind of thematic, big thematic ideas of science fiction of, right, if this thing was to happen, I we would have a war that lasted centuries. What would be the long-term impacts of that? And I think not just in terms of economy, but in terms of family structure, sexuality especially is 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 went into quite a lot and repeatedly through through the book. Exactly what that would mean for for our civilization, and really about the meaning of war. Then, what is the point of war in the big terms? And of course, I'm sure that's to me that's what the whole book is about. And I went back kind of for the first half going. This book isn't as good as I thought it was, and then getting to the end and going, no, actually, it's much better than I thought it was in a lot of those things that I've that I've talked about. Mm. Yeah, I think the fact that he's not anyone significant makes it a more powerful story. Like it makes it a more powerful way to make the point that I think it's trying to make. It is he's just someone who's sort of buffeted around and has almost no control over anything that's happening. And, you know, towards the end, also, he goes back fully expecting to be re-enlisted or whatever the word is, that to be sent back again to uh, fight some more. And he's resigning himself to it. So, and, yeah, we'll talk about the end when we get to it. But even as a major, we see he doesn't really have 
enough say in anything pretty much so i think that made for really powerful storytelling even though he wasn't a very interesting character though i thought he had some really good moments of humor um yeah <laughs> he yeah overall i think that 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 was a good way to tell the story what did you think about his um you know the the situation where uh either memories were implanted in their their brains um false memories or um you know when he did become was it a major that he was the highest the highest rank mm -hmm. um yeah. that um you know he was almost totally brain you know he had this whole brain um reconfiguration um and i just wonder where where are we with that do you do you feel like that's a comment on where media was going or was that really a comment on on where um you know military preparedness was going you know i was wondering if you think that's anything that's bearing out in real society now, since he seems to be so prescient. Yeah, he, he definitely had a concern about government control over the population. Because uh, there, there's, there's mind control, like this hypnosis, brain wipe, uh, you know, sexual reorientation, and whatever else they, they uh, the government offered you know offered in quotes to the citizens um and so it's it was uh he brought up a lot of those points i don't know if he really delved too deep into some of those it was kind of a a mention by the narrator that these things were happening and you got a like as they went through the story that what's it the character mandela right that's, that's the mm -hmm. character's name yeah um you uh you saw how he viewed some of these changes, but it never really delved too deep into how much control that government was forcing or coercing or or the population was just accepting part of it. You know, it's it, there was a lot of questions up in the air as to whether how deep the involvement was. Um, I don't know how, how you guys felt about that. This, this is my favorite thing about, about classic sci-fi in general, both in terms of this book and actually one of the books that's a couple of the ways down, which I read this year and I just thought was one of the greatest things I've ever had. All you have to do is plant the seed. You know, the idea that, okay, as as um, Leila said there, they did this thing and he just tells you about it, but he doesn't leave the judgment as to what the reasons were for that or the impact of that is for yourself. It's just left for you, the reader, to speculate. And for me, that's way more fun than actually him telling me because it, it leads very much into these discussions and to say, go, well, what does it mean? But to me, I think if you go back to the start and have the say that they only recruited the people at the start who were 150 IQ plus. So they took the, the, these really smart, intelligent people at the start and basically threw them in a war, which you can talk about. I thought at the start, that's a waste of life, you know, a waste of intelligence progress on the planet itself. But then education itself has been reduced to these quick screening of either using VR technology or, to, or information dumps where the route and path of learning is pointless. It doesn't feed the war. It doesn't help the war effort. All they need is people with skills and with people with knowledge and they info dump it at them. And mm -hmm. to kind of Leila's point where she's talking about where does that actually lead? I think we are sort of in this ever increasing speeding train to this eventuality employers whether it's military or otherwise but even employers today don't want people to go on a learning journey they just want people with the skills and the skill set at the end of it, and they want them to get it quickly and even people are very quick to go i don't want to go through the journey i just want to can i do a six-week course and i will know everything about the history of the universe put that on a, on a banner and see how many people sign up to that i mean that's exactly where where the information age is take it, taking us now there's no kind of development of skills and it's sort of pressing because it obviously is the technology of the matrix film i remember reading that and going i wonder if that was lifted straight from the book or the idea the kernel came from that moved on to basically say you plug yourself in and within a couple of hours you will have x 
Y's and Z skills. Mm. But I thought it was more about the role of education within that modern society for me is the thing that I take away. And that education as a as an idea, there's no point anymore. It's not feeding the machine. It's not we're not advancing society. It's about you see, people will, will make the decisions for us and we just need grunts on the ground to action them out. Wow, you're actually I'm even having a, an epiphany here in regard to, you know, AI and computer <laughs> Computer chips in the brain, everything else. Let's all go write a short story now about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, I think, you know, it's not exactly where we are, but I, I really think that point about how education happens and who they're selecting for, you know, these journeys is all very, yeah, very yeah. interesting. I, sorry. Yeah. Um, whether or not he intended to point to specific types of technology, it, we can point to counterparts. I think you mentioned media, Leila, as you know the thing that <laughs> works into our brains and make makes us think a certain way, just by like hammering the point repeatedly over and over. And um, AI also. There, there's counterpoints to everything. I think we can think of even if um, Haldeman did not specifically think of those specific technologies we yeah i yeah you you guys say prescient i i agree <laughs> quite yeah. a bit uh, there was one thing that we didn't see it and you know I'm, I'm just curious more than anything else there's not a lot of education and all the smart people apparently are being sent off into space so who's back home developing the space technology needed to improve <laughs> what they need <laughs> for the war right I, that feels like a bit of a disjointed thing that you still need to focus quite a bit on education to get people to um, what um, research the, and fund yeah. the war efforts. But yeah, but but the point was taken, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and they even talked about the idea that education was the last eighteen years and the last six have been taken at home or in a community center and kind of done mm -hmm. distance learning. I mean. The idea that in 1974 somebody was writing the book about distance learning and kind of people yeah, learning no. from home and things is sort of like mm -hmm. what are you kidding me mm -hmm. this, this is a saddle thing that he was talking about not a technological thing necessarily but he was talking about you know and in the future this is probably what will happen and he was talking about 2600 2700 probably in, in terms of his book but it mm -hmm. just goes to show you how the speedy and advance of uh of progress kind of bleeds out into society yeah 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 That was one of the, That's the, the how it happened, you know, in our society or in the books. It's it's uh, it's not as important as why the motivation about mm -hmm. it. Why is it happening? Um, what did he see back then that probably we are only seeing now? Mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, that's the sort of thing that I wondered, you know, because it's it's so bizarre for me. Like if if I had read the book twenty five years ago. I probably thought it was uh, the most comical uh, interpretation of the future. I, I, I think I would feel about the book very differently than what I feel now. Uh, uh -huh. I'm not laughing. I'm just like, wow, you know, this yeah. this guy was a genius uh, to understand society and human nature so well that he could predict or imagine a world where this would happen. Uh, yeah, so thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he obviously uh, he influenced um, William Gibson, uh, who wrote the Neuromancer novels. Um, much later, but uh, Gibson had a lot of um, that societal connection of kind of uh, predicting the internet the way the way that he did. And uh, I know he he wrote about Haldeman in this book in particular as being an influence on some of his writing. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, uh, there was that connection, yeah, with the, um, with this, you know, his future vision of uh, how society could be connected in that manner. Yeah. And, and yeah. to kind of Susanna's point, if we'd have read this 25 years ago, and I agree, I just wouldn't have got any of the 
kind of yeah. nuance that, that it was pointing at you. Uh, but yeah, we've lived 25 years of being a taxpayer, of being somebody that's worked for various companies, that's been kind of been a cog in a machine. And yet Haldeman was basically a cog in the Vietnam War in the same way. He probably looked around the people that he was looking and seen how humanity was a resource or life was a resource rather than necessarily valued or being used for any kind of future gain. It was very much about turning, we just need more bodies. And then mm. and kind of, even in that four or five year period, how he, he came out of that and went, oh, this is the direction of humanity. Like he can see it in like a sh short space of time, whereas obviously we probably need a bit longer because like an awful lot of people, when I was 20, 25, I thought the world was worked very differently than a than I do now, for instance, mm. and certainly events of the world have influenced how we see that, etc. But yeah, I think it's a, it's all a nice microcosm of humanity's path for the next hundred years or whatever it is. Yeah, um, I am recently um, rewatching a lot of somewhat older shows like uh, Frasier, and I've been reading uh, Conspirata by Robert Harris. The Cicero trilogy mm -hmm. in which he talks a lot about politics in ancient Rome and what strikes me the most is that things aren't all that different they were just different people um, and I wonder to Susanna's point if that's what it was this it th the society wasn't exactly how he wrote about it in this book but maybe there were seeds or things he saw that he had a thought experiment and like blew it up to see what it would look like if this became a main event for instance um, yeah, I think the most recent episode we saw in Frasier was the, the um, there was an argument about politics that my husband and I very much related to, and um, and that made sense even now, which is what twenty years later since the show was made, and the Cicero trilogy was even worse. It's been several millennia, and it still hits home. So, yeah, it, maybe it was all there and. Uh, so we agree with it because it's still here. Mm. Very much agree. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's something that uh, um, Haldeman could have taken his experiences in Vietnam and uh, be able to articulate that kind of vision from that experience just, you know, a few years later. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh you know that's that's a powerful ability <laughs> I mm. wish I had <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it speaks to his, sorry go ahead oh, no no go ahead I was just gonna say it speaks to his level of genius like there was a guy who was just a his life could have just been lost you know just mm. as part of a war you know a war effort just that somebody was lost in, in in very tragic circumstances through again no fault of his own yet you get something like really prescient and, and knowledgeable that, that has inspired thousands and thousands of writers and creators etc going forward and that people are very much eulogized as being a very important work in, in and around that time which is contained in what 239 pages or something of a book like it's right. it's bizarre yeah. And, yeah. and even within that I would say I was surprised at the pro style because it's very conversational all the way through it. Again, I was expecting it to be a bit heavier in terms of reading style, yeah. but it's not. It's a very easy, straightforward read. Some might say it's a bit boring in places because of its sort of monotonous conversational nature. But I think within that, you've got the interplay of everything else that's happening mm -hmm. uh, in the world and between the characters. Yeah. yeah. It I think these old books say a lot in <laughs> very few things. <laughs> Sorry, Leila. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, that, that, that was everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, what, what occurred to me, too, I know there's uh, different opinions on um, the Wheel of Time, <laughs> but uh, Robert Jordan also was a uh, Vietnam veteran. And mm -hmm. so I did find myself making some broad comparisons again because you know, Robert Jordan was dealing with mental health with his his main uh, character, Rand. Um, but what I really thought about was they both, um, and you know, there is kind of a slight difference. Like this book was written in the mid 70s, early to mid 70s, and Robert Jordan took forever to write his books. But, um, you know, there is a, a the issue of mental health, but more, I I kind of looked at both from how they portrayed women in combat 
situations or in, you know, fight situations, and they both seem to be trying to give them agency. I think Halderman was, uh, for his time, giving them agency. Um, but both seem to have this unusual uh, sexual assault issue in their books. And did you notice that Halderman, like I think the woman was drunk, and so there's kind of a did he or did he not take advantage of her? And there's a similar theme in uh, The Wheel of Time with a character who is taken, who actually it's a female character who takes advantage of, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, you know, Rand's friend. I'll remember it in a moment. So, Matt. Matt, or Perry. This. <laughs> Matt, yes. Matt. I mean, Matt. it seems a humorous situation, but actually, if you think about it, it's not that humorous, you know, because Matt was trapped, you know. But so I was kind of drawing comparisons there between these two folks. And um, so but I guess my question to you would be about women's uh, portrayal and agency in the books. And I think overall he did well, but I wonder yeah. what you all think. Yeah. Well, he had that line in there about I, women had to be compliant I, and permissive. Yeah by custom mm -hmm. he made it law. clear that they, they were compliant and yeah. it and it was mandatory um and it wasn't just the women everyone was kind of forced to sleep with each other at the mm -hmm. beginning which if you think about it it's uh playing the devil's advocate here uh it's it's a, a, good, a very good way if you're gonna have men and women in, in that in such close quarters and combat situation it's a great way to get rid of sexual tension mm -hmm. of jealousy of possession, uh, you know, it's of office romances, forbidden romances, you know, because it all that is a, a distraction, and it's still a way to keep everyone well, sexually happy, uh, so not to add to the stress and the frustration of the situation. So within the context, and since everyone seems to, you know, have signed up for it, and there was no one actually being abused, even though those poor women in the other planet, there were just a few of them. I, I felt sorry for them. But anyway, I, I guess I didn't see it as rape. Just see it as uh, mm -hmm. uh, something that you just have to deal with, perhaps even enjoy, but it, it, it matched the situation. Uh, as the Wheel of Time, sorry, I, I thought it was funny, you know, all the, the, the whole chapter with Matt. Because he, he oh. was such a humanizer in the, his own way. I think uh, he deserved the taste of his poison just, just a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's what... Um, abused, it was fine. Yeah, because he definitely had, uh, you know, put it out there too. He had definitely... Um, mm -hmm. not he was no saying, yeah. yeah. So, but they both tried to deal with it. And Halderman, you know, was was it was just like everything else he's portraying is he just putting it out there for us to evaluate you know versus um, endorsing you know a way of of being so well i wonder how much of uh what he saw in vietnam influenced mm -hmm. his um his portrayal of the military with men and women in it because you didn't have women in vietnam combat so i'm wondering how much mm -hmm. of that you know uh influenced that and what he saw there that made him portray it in that manner i i sort of read this whole book the second time going i want to see the evidence that this was written in 1974 somewhere on the page if you know what i mean whether it was attitudes to females in the military whether it was attitudes to sexuality and every time i kind of thought ah yes well there's a classic representation of like dated attitudes he would use it in another way further down the line i mean one the fact that there were lots of females present within the military uh, in different roles kind of said of a progression that actually understood that that was going to be the direction of travel there and then about how then treated all of sexuality as like one small thing at the start like they say the compliance etc at the start but then how that became actually everything about 
going into the homo sex and the fact that one sense and, and relationships and sex were actually seen as a an unnecessary complication in war and then fast forward to when he's mm-hmm. the major when he he's very in the sexually frustrated phase when he can't control his anger his temper all of his hormones and actually how he realizes that the lack of relationship at that stage was hindering his ability to lead and do all the and operate yeah. within a work context. So he, he kind of wrapped it all full around. Circle, it. Yeah. it was full full circle, yeah. and he kind of used it a lot of times rather than just kind of simply stating one at one time. Oh, this is what happened right now. He just kind of kept on looping back around it and kind of going, "Well, here we are, a hundred years later, and this is what the attitudes are to are to now." And you know, like so so clever and so well thought out, and not representative of nineteen seventy four, which I sort of was hoping for the whole time that I'd find something to kind of go, "Ah, you see, you know." Even even the the idea of a homosexual when when he says, "Oh, I'm very open to that," and the the, the guy in the psychopathic report says, "Well, yeah, you appear to be," which is kind of what we as the reader have been looking up as he's been making these sort of uh, veiled comments about about homosexuality the whole way through the book, in which he thinks that he's been very open and acceptable, but we as the reader are kind of going, "Well, yes, but you're also very prejudiced and ju- judgmental at the same time because of it." So like all of that stuff's so rich. Yep. Yeah. yeah. A great detail. Yeah. yeah. I think the line that you mentioned, Jared, I did have a knee jerk reaction to that. But then also in the very beginning of the book, um, we are told that women ask the men and they have That's to right. almost have to say yes. Mm-hmm. So I kind of read that as just something he said. Maybe to explain to us that you know women might tend to be judged, but oh, they are required to be promiscuous. But maybe the men are too, and we didn't read about it. Like that's how I <laughs> dissipated my yeah. anger at that line. But uh, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> um, but also I really agree with what you said, Chris. I, he really played with that theme. And again, there are many places where one can potentially have knee-jerk reactions and say, oh no, this character is homophobic, so the author must be homophobic. But really, it's the character and the rest of the world, it's okay. So we're just seeing a reaction to that, which may or may not match with the readers and we may have our own opinion about it. But I think it's still very suited to our time. It's not that he's representing a person who isn't quite open to it for many reasons, because he's been gone for um centuries and things have changed a lot um but also could be representative of you know people who just don't like things changing on them so yeah there, there's a lot there that you could get angry about because it feels like um something that you shouldn't say in today's day and time but it's just a character saying something and if you read the rest of the world it it's not the author <laughs> saying oh, those yeah. things yeah, yeah. That's what I thought was great. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I thought what I thought was great was that, you know, he was going through time, you know, forward. um, And uh, it it really I love the details of how just these little things helped us realize, you know, that great leaps of time have happened, whether having to catch up on the politics. But one was where his uh, reports, people who were reporting to him had to learn his dialect, Mm. you know, because it was Mm. an older dialect. And I just thought, how cool is that? (laughs) Um, I wouldn't want to be in a position of having to learn a dialect, but I thought it was just really cool the way he represented that in the book. Or even to think it would be a be a thing. I mean, you look how many dialects and words and phrases and things that have appeared in the life in the in fifty years from nineteen seventy four till now, to the point that uh, the Gen Z Gen X kind of generation that they are almost hard to understand, especially in written form. You know, in, in terms of language, even uh, the close proximity that we have, even as the parents. You know, well, I would say his military yeah. experience ties yeah. into that as well because I remember going to basic training and barely understanding half of the guys that were in my in my room because they're from all parts of diff- different parts of the country and you have a lot of accents I, you know my accent's been pointed out before on this channel <laughs> and uh and uh you had you know you have people from all over the place and so i wonder if that played into his um you know his knowledge of uh 
of how dialects change over the years and, and people's accents change and, and the, the language changes. That's a, That's a great point. Yeah. 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 And, and we also saw how that alienated him from, like there were many reasons why he was different and alienated by the rest of his company and or strike forces or what they were called uh, and language was one of them he wasn't able to communicate with them I, I think that is a really big deal because I I mean um, maybe not in the US so much but I know in India language is a very great part of identity so uh, if you're not able to communicate to people <laughs> in their language or if you're able to talk to people in their language even if it's really broken versions of it they immediately relate to you and um, it, so you know the fact that he's not that they speak his language but he doesn't uh, maybe that also potentially contributed to their lack of a good relationship that yeah mm -hmm. Or, or even the idea that everybody had to learn his dialect and he didn't yeah. have to learn theirs because of his seniority is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's a good point, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, no, there was another... one thing that it was kind of hard to believe. I was uh, saying there was one thing that was kind of hard to believe for me, uh, but I guess that would be a completely different story, it was how little people actually cared that he he was so old or that he lived in a different era. You know, it was so natural for them. You would expect that, you know, people would just <clears throat> ask him stuff about how things used to be or just a little bit more curiosity. So either they they learned all of it or they didn't care. I mean, they're, they're, again, it would be a completely different story. That was not what the book and the characters were um, focused, but I think it was a, a missed op opportunity there just now and again to have someone show some interest i don't know yeah you, you have this Just whole time dilation thing going on mm -hmm. and i i didn't think he he really engaged that much at all uh mm -hmm. compared to some of the other stuff that he that he uh delved into in in this book um yes i i noticed that too that, that it was just uh it was kind of glossed over a bit that that part of it i mean it's only like chris said it's a short book so <laughs> how much you're gonna throw in there but <laughs> oh we lost oh, later. Gosh, yeah. so, interestingly i think he sort of does deal with it a little bit because i actually think one of the very biggest ideas that's in this book is you know around population control right and how the population of earth was fluctuating up and down mm -hmm. and they got to a stage where procreation was basically outlawed it was seen as no longer a thing they wanted to cap the population at one billion and they basically uh -huh. grew babies in order to generate population right which in its own right within a paragraph is kind of one thing but what that actually means for society is that the family unit no longer exists mm. relationships aren't aren't mm. there there is not a a an idea that anybody would be in a current nurturing relationship where you would even ask or ask after other people your interrelations with people uh the heterosexual and the homosexual relationships are all just it's all sort of seen as an, an an unnecessary thing within within life other than for release or otherwise so if there is no family unit there is no nurturing going on anymore and very much again you are just a resource within within the world then your idea of asking after the next person maybe doesn't happen you know where, where, where does that come from where does the conversational nature sure. of society where you grow uh, all come from and yeah. I, uh, for me that was the bit that kind of like oh wow yeah that's a big that's a big intuitive leap on yeah. uh, your part mm -hmm. there, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. it's point. uh because like like Susanna said it was it was very quick um and so there's a lot to cover there as far as societal changes and mm -hmm. stuff like that and it is done very very quickly in the book uh because as even that short sentence you just you just said there's a whole bunch to unpack there. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's why this is a book that gets read by people again and again and again and again, because every time they go to it, I mean, well, if that happened, then that would mean X, mm. Y, and Z, you know, come forward. That, 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 that isn't just a, a thing in its own right. And again, 
as a sci-fi writer, probably of the time, and even even now, when people write in shorter books, they were, I think they were respecting the intelligence of the reader to kind of say, rather than me telling you the outcome of this, actually, you can theorize to what the outcome is, because that makes for far more interesting conversation and unpacking of my book than me spending another hundred mm -hmm. pages of it. You know, I could put another hundred pages of it in, but it's mm -hmm. way more interesting without that, I think, rather than than actually putting it in. Because it, as Susanna quite said, it wasn't that book. That wasn't the purpose of the story. These are all just other things that are happening alongside. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder, in addition, I, they, they they said something about schools, right? Or after a certain age, they are kept in group and and then after a certain age, they leave. So uh, I assume the school or equivalent organization teaches everyone the same thing in this world. So it's mm. just an extremely indoctrinated society that all believes the same thing and is very certain of their beliefs. They don't have um, counterpoints or different opinions to um, debate and have different opinions on. So maybe... Um, there's the sum total of their opinion is you're deviant, uh, you're from the past, but we'll tolerate it because we have to, and that's it. And really, they don't tolerate it all that much, um, we, as we see towards the end. So, yeah, I think, yeah, that's a great point, Chris. I wonder if <laughs> there's uh, further consequences of that mm -hmm. as well. But didn't they create a whole different planet to put people? Mm -hmm. That had yeah. the different mm -hmm. viewpoint or whatever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. So the second year of it, yeah. Is that? Yeah. You know, the, That's one way to do it, but so far you only have one planet. Right. Uh, you know. I'm not sure how I feel about that because then you have almost a segregation. You know, and uh... But did you not read that and go, especially because at the time he was looking for home? He was yeah. looking for somewhere to be be home, and he, and he couldn't was. integrate into the normal society. You kind of felt, well, at least there is somewhere for him to go. And even though the first time, when he does return to Earth the first time, you see that society is completely broken down there as well. I mean, the only place that looked at it could have a bit of society were those groups of people that were relying on each other for free food. You know, mm. when they were building the ration farms, they seemed like they had a bit of society. And obviously, it ended in tragic circumstances, uh, for when went through like this highly effective action scene, I think probably more than any of the other action scenes in the book. I think that one really knocked the most home for me mm -hmm. in terms of that was happening on on Earth in a place that was supposed to be the world was supposed to be protecting. You know, mm -hmm. we were supposed yeah. to be fighting for those ideals, and like all oh, society was just in pieces. People, you know, didn't have credit or money anymore. There were there were currency was calories. I thought, what a genius idea, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, to have to have. <laughs> As a, as a construct, like just so, so, so clever. Yeah, yeah. That that was funny and clever. <laughs> yes, yeah. It made me laugh quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was really clever as well. Uh, yeah, it raises a lot of questions about, uh, you know, the um, what we believe money is, and you know what what. <laughs> And how mm -hmm. it's all uh, how it's all tied into our societies and stuff like that, the, the fiction of money, if you will. <laughs> Especially for these people, were for whom money meant nothing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, these people were accruing salary over this period of time, coming back to the vast, enormous wealth, but actually they were just spending half their money on like a week's worth of groceries, you know, because inflation mm -hmm. had just taken off that stage. And it, it does beg the question of, in a world where you know, we have a planet full of resources, etc. What are the important resources? Because obviously, you know, in terms of like in our world at the moment, oil is a very precious resource, etc. But if there was no water anymore, or people were hoarding water, <laughs> oil would mean nothing. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, it's it's exactly. not actually supporting life or anything. So it does make you think about what the important resources that that we have and where we fund our time and energy and money and yeah. yeah. That's what I mean with how, how much more he might have got mm -hmm. right by the end of the decade. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Going yeah. like this. Yeah, the guns were scary. <laughs> uh, that, yeah. he, that you could buy a gun at a mall, that was vaguely terrifying. <laughs> but apparently <laughs> they also had improvements in medicine to fix gunshot wounds. So <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> if it does happen in our world, hopefully both of those go together. <laughs> 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 the 
as, the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, as a question, how did everybody find the science of the book? I was very happy with it. That uh, it, it only uh, explained what it needed to, because any more explanation would just fall apart. And you, yeah. you still have to go from the beginning with a very open mind and say, okay, so this is this happened, it, that's the premise, fine. You don't need to explain it, I don't want to know. Tell me how it works and I'll go with it. Yeah. So it was very clever, very fast, and no need for a huge world building. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Just fill in the blanks with your imagination and, and that's fine. Yeah. I, I find myself even just going very quickly through the little he did explain i was just like <laughs> i was like yeah okay all right let me get to the, let me get to the other stuff <laughs> I, i'm not a big fan of pseudo science techno speak myself so mm -hmm. it doesn't uh, doesn't appeal to me <laughs> so uh, i kind of just sped read through those parts i thought um i mean i don't know enough about rel relativity to say one way or the other but i think a lot of the things that he did explain are actual science, uh, not so much pseudoscience, but there were some things that um, I think the more uh, biology and other non-physics sciences, maybe those were a little made up perhaps. And he did he did um, have, he didn't do any AI, but he did do some biology. He talked about some evolutionary science also, I think from other planets and, yeah, there is an interesting point he makes towards the end that I'd like to talk about. But in terms of the science, I thought, uh, yeah, I, I love reading science fiction for the science. And I thought the bits in this were very well done. Uh, they they made me, I, I don't know, there's something about science fiction books that makes me think about them constantly and imagine the stars all the time. I don't know why that <laughs> is. And, and this book, uh, yeah, I, it took very little of getting into it to make me want to keep coming back to it for that reason. I'm I'm very much one of those people that likes a bit of science, but if the science is going to be there, it's got to at least be factually work. It has to, it has to be correct. And the relativity, as, as you said, he, he kind of talks very limitedly about, but it, it, he is right and it is true. Mm -hmm. But those numbers, I don't know whether he run the, the numbers through the relativity formula or not, but, you know, in terms of time scales, et cetera, and the distances, that, there, that was all right, but there was a couple of other nice things that I thought were again. Here's a book indicative of 1974, so at the, at, and it did go, make me go to Google. So they mm. talked about the people that have been tested. Do you remember the people that had died at the start because they were kind of highly sensitive to ESP? Basically, their ESP was uh -huh. very high, and they said they were Ryan tested. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't know this, but Ryan was the guy who was the scientist at a, at, a, at the late 60s who was doing the work in that. And he obviously, Hallman had postulated that it would be called the Ryan test because that's who the scientist was at the time and kind of pulled it forward. Whereas we call it now kind of ESP testing and you know, mm. extra sensory perception. Um, and then even the things about the, the force gloves that they were using about how they worked in the logarithmic scale of how force would kind of multiply mm. up and stuff. I was yeah. like, this stuff's all really cool. Like I, I can yeah. see how this is a, as a construction, give me some ability to do in straight times of storytelling when they get stuck. In the ground, for instance, you know, they'd be saying, well, just dig with your hands. And I thought, you're mm -hmm. of course, because your your hands, your gloves are actually these powered machines at the moment. These can kind of dig massive, like basically big diggers in your hands. Yeah. And if they had realized it soon enough. So a lot of that stuff was like in terms of physics anyway, I, mm -hmm. I thought was just like, sort of delicious the whole way through it. But I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is this is real. Yeah. This is really meaty and nice and it makes me go and investigate little bits of it to say, oh, I don't. Mm -hmm. I want to understand a bit more about that or understand a bit less about that, maybe. And the biology is, as far as you quite says, there's quite a lot of that towards the end of the book. Hmm. Leila, I don't know if you can hear us. Do you have an opinion on the science in the book? Um, mostly, I, um, you know, I had questions. I, I wasn't sure. Um, I would say, like, like I said, the distance between the sun and the planet beyond Pluto, that was a little thing. And, and really the, um, the way time was described, I don't know. It sounds like you all may have been discussing that or relativity, but. We didn't talk about no. it in detail. But oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I wondered uh, how accurate that was or if he was even in the ballpark of how, time uh, would move 
um, you know, relative to where you are. And I think there is something to it. And maybe he just stretched it a bit because they do say, um, you know, like when you when you fly a, on a plane on a jet that, um, you know, there'll be a like a very slight difference between a clock where you originated from and your own timepiece on the jet, you know, so, so maybe something to that. Yeah, but those yeah. are the only ones I can think of. Of course, the regrowing of the limbs, I thought was really cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool technology yeah. to have. Yeah. It reminded me yeah. of Skelly Grow in Harry Potter. <laughs> I wonder if she had the idea from this book. <laughs> um, I was going to say something. Oh, I watched a video. I think it was PBS Science or something in which they uh, talked about whether a photon, if, if something moves at the speed of light, whether it experiences time or not. Avatar. And yeah. um, and the answer was it doesn't. It's basically stationary, I think. Um, yeah. So the, the part in the end uh, where... Mary Gay uh, is just frozen in time in the uh, stasis ship. Is that what they call it? Mm -hmm. And that was moving at a very high percentage of the speed of light. So she would age very little. Yeah, that, that made sense, I think. So I expect all the other, based on the video that I watched the other day. So I expect everybody, <laughs> everything else made sense. But I don't have enough of a physics background. I only have um, college level physics. So that yeah. I don't remember much from there. Uh, what, one other thing that strikes me science-wise is, again, here's another future study with a very big reliance on drugs to manipulate, you know, energy mm -hmm. levels, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the, the STEM tabs earlier on, you obviously have, you know, the ability to stay awake, etc. So again, pushing forward, this is mid seventies. We are now in, <laughs> The new century i think uh, drugs is a way to manipulate and manage mood sexuality all of that thing is, is very much uh, a prevalent thing mm, yeah they had a uh, counter drugs for addiction so you could you could enjoy the thing without the addiction yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. both yeah. the author and the character were a product of their time um, <laughs> in, in that regard i think yeah yeah, yeah. it was uh a whole lot of drug experimentations in the 60s he came out of so. <laughs> doesn't surprise me that's in there at all <laughs> yeah yeah there was um yeah the part where he explains how his last name came about i was just <laughs> brilliant love that bit i did not see that coming at all <laughs> but, <laughs> but um also i thought just thinking about it now it feels like a statement of what's been lost in the current version of the world because you had so much diversity in culture that his parents could name something after i think it's a hindu thing but i could be wrong but um yeah and his parents named something after the culture that you know that is far away from where they are and now we've co coalesced into this society with one consciousness uh yeah <laughs> how do you guys feel about that <laughs> Terrified. Yeah. <laughs> I I have a feeling if anybody's interested in this, that, that our discussion of the last book of the expanse will cover this in quite some detail, actually. Uh mm -hmm. because it's very much a big massive theme of, of that book. Uh, but you're right, that, that somehow this is seen as advancement is uh, mm -hmm. a, a far far spread, a far flung truth from what I think a lot of us accept we accept it as the kind of joys of life, you know, the very mm -hmm. differences between us are mm -hmm exactly or what makes life great rather than yeah. actually conforming to, to one thing yeah yeah you're right yeah. it's terrifying yeah the <laughs> the loss of uh loss of individuality i yeah. would think would be a, a, a crime mm -hmm. against humanity actually so <laughs> i think we need yeah. that but you can see how you can see how it could happen oh because, yeah because yeah. uh you know i i could be sitting here going if only i had jared's voice <laughs> you know, 
my life would be improved to ten, tenfold. You know what I mean? If only I had his his really wonderful accent or something like that. And people say, right, you can have that if you want. You know, and uh, <laughs> you know, so, so you can see how the, you can see how those like small things. It's the same with like prosthetics was... and, and plastic surgery, etc. You know, there's themed as improvements, but often the end result is something more monstrous than than what than what was set out. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the accent didn't help me at all, but the <laughs> <laughs> but might help uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, it, you just like mentioned prosthetics. You know, it, is it improvement or is it just different? You know, and uh, um, and it's you know for most for everybody, I think who has it's just an adjustment. You know, it's yeah. not uh, mm -hmm. necessarily an improvement in life. It's an adjustment, and then yeah. you hopefully uh you know improve your life in in other ways but uh that's yeah that's yeah. uh another thing to think about with this book <laughs> yeah but, but also but also is it did it happen because of the monstrous nature of the way that earth evolved at the time because they could never get back to what earth once was i mean by the time they had started to make changes etc at that point you know Society had broken down, food was scarce, you know, the overpopulation, then they tried to control population, how they tried to do it. Like these governmental ideas or changes were coming in and ultimately were making everything worse with every iteration that, that came around. So to the end that maybe people were just like, if we could just live in peace, you know, or if we could just have enough to sustain us and people will make small sacrifices along the way to that end that we end up mm -hmm. with an homogenous society. Uh, was it a result of that or was it really seen as progress? That is one of the probably the big questions that you're left to come away with from that at the end. It felt to me like um, Haldeman was almost making the point that this is this is inevitable in the evolution chain uh, because of something he uh, something he said about Torrance that they had already evolved to being a sing all clones of a mm -hmm. single consciousness. And it felt like they were a slightly, he, it, my reading of that was that he was saying that they are a slightly more advanced consciousness. They had already evolved to that stage. And um, maybe it was war that precipitated the human evolution to that stage. But it sounded like he was saying that that's where we're all ending up. Uh, I thought that was the point he was trying to make. And I didn't, well, <laughs> I don't know if I agree, but. Agree is also not the right word. I, I don't know if that makes sense. I would. Um, and also another thing that I wanted to ask or discuss in that regard is the uniform consciousness said that uh, if things don't work out for this one, if they turn out to be not oh, okay, yeah. they would just replace with a different consciousness. But who's making that decision it's this person why would they ever make a decision to exterminate themselves right so mm -hmm. that i don't know if the inherent mm, conflict in that was baked in it's by design or if it's just not really making sense in the plot yeah. that's a good point uh i mean the book is a um it is a warning of against war yeah uh and so the consequences of a forever war could lead to that single consciousness, which wasn't very well portrayed as a good thing in mm. the book. Um, so maybe that's his, you know, that's his warning. That's his warning to the readers and stuff like that in society, basically. Mm. Um, yeah. You mean that it makes, it makes, uh, a society single-minded mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. arguments no conflicts mm -hmm. everyone in agreement yeah it's yeah it's staying scary <laughs> but also what does this consciousness find to like where does it find the will to live on why would it for instance breed more humans <laughs> um but i suppose you could make that argument about other hive consciousness in the animal kingdom so yeah but it is where's There's... the where's the where's the purpose and, mm -hmm. and also that it took for all of this progress and they've got the thing i've written down the book 3143 is is the uh the end date 
for a lot of this. It took a guy from the 20th century, from 1974, to point out that actually the flaw in the biology of having the single consciousness and actually this would be a problem and we mightn't be able to see the problems with this for another thousand years and by mm. then is it too late to fix or what actually yeah. happens at that point it's just like <laughs> so good but mind-blowing an awful lot of, like the possibilities of an awful lot of this are far-reaching yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i find that to be a, a conceit in a lot of science fiction where the modern person has the foresight to point out what's wrong with society the way society is going rather than the people who are living in the time that's mm -hmm. uh that happens quite a bit <laughs> yeah especially in time travel stories and stuff like that but also in these kind of stories where the guy's way into the future from where he's or his origins are you know mm. It's not a new thing either, though. I think that's one of the things, reasons I'm keen to see um, Oppenheimer, you know, mm -hmm. the movie, the Christopher Nolan movie, because, again, nuclear technology has been around long enough that a lot of people just look to see the possible advantages of nuclear, but actually as, as, as a construct and conceit at the start of how whether we should be dabbling this, those kind of ethical arguments all happen at oh, that yeah. time rather than happening as much now because kind of evolved past an awful lot of that so uh if i would say anything about the current time that we're living in and again how this novel is so relevant and now we're sort of in this culture war and that the idea that you question and you'd be well read and do all of, you know, don't just accept whatever government's going to take from you at the moment is very much the battle that's happening in western society i think at the moment you know where some people are saying no the government's you should always just listen to the government the government's always right versus mm -hmm. people are going actually no i'm not sure that's exactly what we should be doing as a society we should be having these ethical arguments you should be questioning and asking for higher standards of people etc all that kind of stuff's going but but you're right like as, as a book this is the most anti-war book or piece of fiction that i think i've ever seen because it actually does take it through to all those eventualities it doesn't just do a little microcosm it kind of says these are some of the things that could happen and are you okay with that mm -hmm. fine <laughs> <laughs> so the big reveal at the end that was just very casually <laughs> uh, thrown in that the war, uh, th that the government basically lied that the Torrens attacked first. Mm -hmm. Did that? That wasn't, it wasn't as much of a gut punch as it could have been, but it, I think that's possibly also by design. Maybe we saw it coming and it's just sort of confirmed to us but based on what we've seen of the torrents that they just have learned to fight from uh the first combat that we see on the ground it didn't make a lot of sense that they would attack and for what reason and so maybe it was just confirming the reader's beliefs at the end what was it a big reveal for all of you or was it just oh yeah i i, I thought that might be true mm -hmm. uh no, I, I wasn't you surprised. Know, yeah. I thought... Yeah, Yeah. I thought it was a nod to, um, you know, what helped get the U.S. into the Vietnam War was this um, mm -hmm. exactly. situation called the Gulf of Tonkin. I don't yep. know if... Yeah, Susanna, you've heard of it. Probably others have. So it was kind of a... Uh, the U.S. made an accusation that what North uh, Vietnam had attacked a U.S. warship or something, yep. and that launched us into uh, Vietnam. So uh, I just wondered if it was a nod to that mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. Yeah, it could have been. It it was. Um, I'm sure that was on his mind the whole because mm -hmm. you know vietnam was obviously on his mind when he's writing this but the uh yeah it wasn't a surprise at all to me uh that that's how that's how it ended up <laughs> yeah. uh and it was it, yeah. it it ties into that theme of otherness that he creates you know these aliens are the other and that's that's how um the north vietnamese were portrayed during the vietnam conflict was they are the other you know and uh that that's that's very like the obvious theme in this book um and it's and it's and it's uh you're right you're po about pointing out the beginnings of the vietnam war very similar in that regards to 
um, the government was reacting to something that didn't happen, false information, and uh, it just escalated from there. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And then as the war kept on going, does anybody remember what we were fighting for in the very first place? Like the origins mm. of it, you know, by the time, you know, you've got a forever war here that's went on for millennia, essentially. You know, they've been fighting for thousands of years, trying for territory, kind of doing the minutia of war, without ever actually thinking, oh, what, why can anybody tell yeah. tell us and he was there at the start which i think is why him as a character is quite important because if he wasn't there those veterans weren't there then does anybody even know or understand why what war is for like what is the mm -hmm. point of war yeah that's a it great was, point yeah it's just another aspect of life it was uh, yeah if you don't know any difference yeah mm -hmm. like there the were, sorry go ahead go ahead to that no, no, that, I, I was done just having a little <laughs> <laughs> insight. <laughs> Sorry, I thought, I thought you were done. Um, there was, yeah, the other thing that I thought was interesting that uh, was that all the planets on which they attacked Torrance, it was with the sole purpose of extermination because you couldn't establish uh, human colonies there. There was no point to it other than let's kill some Torrance, which I thought was very interesting because wars on Earth, you're probably fighting for territory, like you pointed out, Chris, or some other things you have domination and then you get something out of it and here it is just killing some people you don't even know where their home planet is if you did find it you probably don't want to live there there is absolutely no <laughs> purpose to this other than killing torrents for some made-up purpose so i thought that was really interesting that to i guess the point that it's trying to make is this is pointless uh and that that was very powerfully <laughs> done uh with the space war. I thought it was also very interesting that, um, you know, uh, Mandela was um, tagged as a pacifist by mm -hmm. whatever psychological mm -hmm. program it oh, yeah. him, <laughs> um, but that um, he could still participate in the war because he had, like, psychologically, he saw the military as being responsible for the killing not himself so it's like the institutions doing it not him yeah. as an individual i thought it was really good how mm -hmm. he um portrayed that mm -hmm. yeah and that's why he was the was a great narrator. We were talking at the beginning that he was like a boring character. Yeah. Um, it, it was the perfect character to tell the story because I think he was truly as neutral as it was possible. And yeah. it was right in the middle of it, but it was still kind of outside and he had no control over whatever decision, whatever's going to happen, no control over the time, his life, nothing. And he, he just moseyed along and did what he had to and had a very um, resigned way to to deal with things, to look at, but still optimistic and loyal and, and doing what he had to do. Um, so it, it, there were little gems of, of insight now and then that it, it, it was enough to carry on with all the, the narration and you would get a lot just between the lines because it, it was from his personality being so neutral, you could mm. um, almost project any yeah, yeah. hypothesis uh, so it, it was a very well done character for that story yeah it's, it was the character seemed designed by mm -hmm. Haldeman to have that kind of blank, blank slate to, so that mm -hmm. the reader can be mm -hmm. kind of the character as you're reading along mm -hmm. take in what he sees but then like we were saying earlier create our own um our own thoughts about what's going on there and that's uh that's that's a uh, a common enough approach for pov characters uh first person to make them kind of that that blank space that you can fill in your own mm -hmm. thoughts and personality mm -hmm. with the character it's very hard to do though it's oh very yeah hard. i agree <laughs> <laughs> No, he's he's a, he's he he pulled it off. He pulled it off, and he, he definitely hit all the right beats with with the with the story and the character's viewpoint to really 
uh, make that make that a strong part of the book. Um, so apparently there are two more books in the same world, so to speak. Oh. And uh, Forever Peace is, uh, I think it covers the making of the hive mind, if I'm reading. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Forever Peace is a revetting portrayal of the effects of collective consciousness. So I'm hoping this, because I'm super interested in how that came about. And I like what they did with it in the book. But mm -hmm. if we can get a story about that. And I think the third book called Forever Free is um, follows Mary Gay and Where William <laughs> on the planet called Middle Finger. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Middle Finger, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we talk just a little bit about the subversive nature in which he treats sexuality the whole way through the book mm -hmm. and there's kind of almost mm -hmm. this ping pong effect you know of yeah. current times say that homosexuality is the is the abnormality so to speak mm -hmm. fast forward to you know when he goes back to the earth and you know homosexual is encouraged and you know some people are still heterosexual etc and that again here's another thing that he throws in there talk about use of pronouns has changed he mentioned it in the book that the people were using collective pronouns of they them instead of he she even at, the, at that time i went like wow mm -hmm. what the yes. hell yeah uh, how does that go to then cut forward much later and it's uh this he's seen as the abnormality you know the ab heterosexuality uh, there's a great line actually i've written down is that some of the doctors have an amused uh tolerance for heterosexuality i thought that was just a a great way to put that but actually you know sexuality regardless of what political system or whatever is encouraged people's natural underlying you know sexuality still happens in private and in, in all different ways whether it's homosexual heterosexuality or otherwise even when you know we, lady you were talking about when isn't diana gets drunk later on and that a lot of them are talking about how you know it's horrible the idea of heterosexuality but yet even when she's drunk you can say it's kind of sex assault, but I also think there's an element of it that she wants to try it, or at least it's a, you know, within her to kind of say that I can explore that under these conditions um, mm -hmm. that she can't talk about because it's seen as, as an abnormality. Um, so, yeah, uh, people are sent to be cured. Yeah, I thought, of, I thought of that well. too. I thought of that too, that um, it, it kind of reminded me of I felt like he was saying uh, people are going to be people, you know, people are going to do what they're going to do, okay. yeah. you know, even mm -hmm. though just mm -hmm. like the, you know, the making of alcohol, the still that was going on. Um, and even when he was on earth, he was saying, oh, I can probably find somebody to, you know, some black market somewhere to, to buy what I want. But yeah. um but apparently on Earth, no, but on the ship, uh, people were, you know, they were making, they had a still, they were making alcohol. Um, and uh, at least in that example, they weren't following the, you know, the directive about their sexuality. So, yeah, I think he was saying people are still going to be people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, and they did have a baby at the end. So. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> oh. uh, I think the point that he made about being other, the other way around, whatever is currently is not adopted by the mainstream becomes something to almost ostracize about. So they did claim tolerance, but they kept trying to cure him and they kept um and you know we saw the mutiny in the end which almost entirely was precipitated by his sexuality right um so i i thought that was a really interesting way to show mm -hmm. one <laughs> that uh we have a tendency to other whatever is not mainstream and two up uh, and even if we like exactly just flip sides and two what what is ridiculous about i think maybe in the 70s about uh, othering homosexuals at the time perhaps so yeah i thought that was really well done too i agree chris 
even his mum way you know, mm. the father's dead and yeah, then yeah. she's living with a woman you can sort of see his revulsion at that and yeah. we're not we're, it's not really explained by this revulsion to the fact that it's a woman or the fact that it's not it's just not her father his father do you know yeah. what i mean yeah. but he, he he leaves and, ca and can't even speak to his mum after that you know he, mm. he just has to get as one of his reasons for going back to war you know what what is this world you know and, yeah. and again yeah. that very I'd very, say very strong allegory to people returning from the Vietnam War to yeah. kind of find themselves when I'm trying to reintegrate themselves in the American society and go, well, mm -hmm. who am I now? What kind of world mm -hmm. have I come back to? Yeah, that alienation that the people, yeah. that soldiers yeah. felt coming back from such a situation yeah, was yeah. reflected very well in that, yeah. that those scenes with the mother and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of I mean, like it all. Sorry. Sorry. Say that again. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just saying he's got it all. I mean, mm. he's that like covered so much. Um, one uh, one thing I'm not sure if we talked about was the um, buying the gun at the mall, mm. which is a U.S. thing. I know it's not all over the world. I mean, we're not to we're not we're close to the mall. We're not in the, <laughs> yeah. the shopping mall yet, but um, pretty close. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just found that fascinating as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the fact they sold heroin in bars. Mm. That was another thing that was in the book. So they, again, selling the malls, and you know, the guns in the malls, heroin over the counter bars is this kind of drug suppressant or, you know, the, Rules, regulations, all that kind of stuff didn't matter. It was kind of needs must, whatever. Mm. In the, in the kind of, because it seemed to be like people were paying for bodyguards. You couldn't travel about without a bodyguard. Mm. So a gun was like the, the most minor thing that you needed to carry about with you, especially one that yeah. can just rip people apart into shreds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I thought that scene where he killed the boy was very well done it, yeah. it he was feeling guilty about killing Torrance earlier but then he didn't have an emotional connection to the fact that he killed them like it could be like killing an animal for instance mm -hmm. uh if he let himself think that way about a space faring society but uh here it is he killed another human and yeah we delved into that 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 was pretty well done it was mm -hmm. him right or was yeah. it it was in America. It was him. He. It was, um, it was. Yeah. It was the girl who was getting raped, wasn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. at the, in, in the scene, and he, he saved her. Yeah. But for her stepping up is the reason he got away with it, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah. 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 Just speaks volumes about the world that he came back to. That 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 was okay, and yeah. he didn't even feel bad about it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was a line in that scene that did give me a knee-jerk reaction that I could not dissipate my anger out of. It was uh, something to the effect of um, he got shot for taking something that most people would give freely. I thought that was a terrible way to phrase that. I did not appreciate it at all. <laughs> hmm. Sign of the times, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> when he wrote it. <laughs> But mm -hmm. but again, this idea that they were fighting for Earth, and yet Earth had to be rebuilt in another place called Heaven. You know, the, mm. the, the Earth had become su such an absolute shit show. Excuse the language, <laughs> is that they had to rebuild it somewhere else for somewhere to feel like uh, this. This is what Earth is, or this is this mm. you know, like, place uh, still rebuilt. Which is crazy. Can you remind me of that section? I don't remember that for some reason. So that when hit the Heaven. Yeah, heaven. So when uh, they lost their limbs, um, and they were given like active relief, they were put to. I think it's called heaven. I think it's a lovely yeah. unspoiled earth like world. Yeah. What earth might have been like if the man had treated her with compassion instead of lust. I thought that was a great line. If men had treated the earth with compassion mm -hmm. instead of lust, um, that they went instead there and they used basically all their money to kind of go out and go for trips and eat well and do all of that kind yeah. of stuff. And and if, I'm not mistaken heaven was also the place where all like the decisions were being made too for mm -hmm. the war and all that stuff if mm -hmm. if yeah. i remember that correctly um that seemed yeah. to be like where like you said the, the soldiers would go to get limbs regrown or what have you and uh um but it also seemed to be where uh because earth definitely wasn't that place anymore mm -hmm. like you said it was <laughs> mm -hmm. um and what was the name of the planet that they made later with 
where the head of sesh rolls could go, basically. Middle yeah. finger. <laughs> middle finger, that's right. That's little right. finger, that's right. Okay. <laughs> middle finger, yeah. Middle finger or little finger? Ah, <laughs> oh, middle, middle. Middle, middle. Okay. <laughs> That one. <laughs> yeah. the, the bird. I should have called it the bird. The bird. <laughs> bird him. Uh, little finger. <laughs> Uh, but it was it's kind of funny that they he because that brings up another uh another question about perception and like why is this place called heaven um and why did why the need to name it that uh mm -hmm. and yeah isn't the earth we live on supposed to be you know better aren't we supposed to approve that rather than just writing it off and making a heaven you know and how does that there's a lot of questions there <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the descriptions of heaven were really nice how the cities were integrated and working with the ecosystem rather than trying to destroy it uh i got the impression that might be why it was, uh, or you know in, uh, it was too late to fix earth perhaps <laughs> and so they went to uh, this other planet, but I, um, yeah, I, I really liked the descriptions of heaven. They were really pretty. I didn't like that they had to kill that big, sh big fish in the end, though. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking to myself, why, why is this thing not already dead? Yeah. And then, of course, but but two, three paragraphs later, it yeah. was it was no more. But but I mean, again, not to say, in the expanse floats a lot of these ideas as well if you can travel anywhere in the world and you can travel to any other stars why does one planet or one base become important then if you, mm. you don't like the place that, that earth is then you can just go somewhere else and those mm. kind of bigger ideas obviously we're not ready as a civilization for technologically or otherwise but i think longer term these are issues yeah. that will probably come up yeah Was there anything else to talk about? I'm trying to think if there's there was there, there's a lot that happened towards the end. I'm trying to remember if there was anything else to bring up. Well, I I'm, I'm really glad that there was an happy ending because uh, I was listening to the audiobook and it was just like 15 minutes left and I was like, this is how where where it's gonna end? It's just if, you know I thought you would just be deployed again and you know to be continued or, or something. So I think it was very well wrapped up, yeah. you know, in a romantic and optimistic way. But uh, um, it was good to have that glimmer of hope for humanity yeah. and to see the character, you know, finally settling down and hopefully be happy ever after. So I, um, I can, I am a bit of a sucker for fairy tale endings in that <laughs> regard, and uh, yeah, I really enjoyed I and like. it's so neatly wrapped up just at the end. Very really nice. And, and I think the ending made sense. Like it didn't feel rushed or uh, not earned or anything because the timeline of the story allowed for it. They arrived after being at the farthest reaches of the galaxy that they could have been and came back and they're like, yeah, cool, the war is done. It made sense, right? That they were gone for so long. Um, so yeah, and I, I liked that they got back together with Mary. I would have liked to see her version of the war as well and i believe there is a short story in forever mm -hmm. free that gives us that but yeah i um I'm, i don't know the book structure obviously doesn't allow for it but i would have loved to hear what happened with her uh, other than uh, besides i was i was uh, not aging for 200 years <laughs> <laughs> I'd be the descendant voice and say I don't really like the ending. It didn't you really didn't? fit. No, I, I, especially the first time. I actually didn't. I don't mind the happy ending because you do like something good to happen at the end of the book because it's kind of a bit oppressive the whole way through. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember that when I was saying about my first read through, one of my takeaways from the whole thing was imagine living that, surviving at the end and realizing you had nobody else, to, you had no reason to live for. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I remember thinking mm -hmm. that was that was such a big moment when I got to the end of them surviving that scene and then going, but to what end? Should he just have died at that end? And I think that was a really powerful statement that they could have made in that in that end. And then for him to come home. And the bit with the letter is lovely. Like, it's really, mm. really nice. But I remember at the time going, it's just not quite as powerful as that could have been in terms of, like, a statement to say, 
if there's no reason to live or what are you living for you know the the right to fight for life etc is one that's naturally inbred into all of us but actually at the end of the day this bastardization of civilization and of humanity is it something that's worth saving and mm. i think would have been a much stronger and bigger thing now on second time reading through i was like no i'm, I'm happy enough with the, the, the kid and, you know that that was good <laughs> you know that, that was fine but i remember thinking they could fit much more tonally with the book if it hadn't happened mm. <laughs> yeah so society should have been destroyed and then well, that's, start over or something. <laughs> I, th I think that's the point. Is humanity worth saving at that point? Because, I mean, humanity sort of didn't no longer exist. Certainly not the humanity that we all recognize in some way. Mm. So did it, did it survive? And he, he fought tooth and nail to live and, and for enough of them to survive, to say. But really, the realization should have been, and what? And what now? Yeah, yeah. But isn't the point also that they they weren't at risk of extinction from this uh threat mm. right they whatever humanity did did to itself Self. um so he wasn't even really if you think about it fighting to protect humanity because the torrents didn't know where they were all they had to do was not go near the collapser <laughs> where <laughs> they claimed the torrents were so yeah it I see your point about is humanity worth saving, but he wasn't also really saving. So at the end of it, it's just despair. <laughs> if uh, and and for the character that we've been following, uh, humanity is surviving and doing well with that single consciousness, apparently. So I would have had a very bad taste in my mouth if all he did was jump <laughs> off the cliff at Stargate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i said I, th I think i'm a rereader was much more open to the fact that okay this isn't quite as depressing i'm I, i'm actually quite sure that when he sent this to his publisher his publisher sent it back and went mm. you need to put an ending on here yeah that uh, yeah. that gives humanity some hope i it feels like a hollywood focused tested ending mm. rather than necessarily one that fit Tony <laughs> yeah. with the rest of the book i would be interested to know <laughs> yeah yeah awesome. that's a great point i would love to know what yeah that sounds like because it's so small, maybe it yeah. was. It feels almost like an afterthought. Yeah, yeah. But I'm glad. Like, I, I, Mary guys, Mary Gay seemed like a very nice character. They seemed like yeah. a very nice couple. It seemed like you know a lot of things that he was saying about you know if she had just been pos positioned with me, why were we split up in the first place? Like, yeah. it's never made any sense in the first place uh, that they were were broken up like that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was also interesting that um, there was a line in there when they got separated and they got separate commands about how they thought years into the future, but absolutely gave no consideration to the humans involved, which is a very powerful statement. I Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think, uh, do you think the sequels delve more into the, um, you know the time dilation in the in the collective humanity thing the collective humanity yes i think the second book is probably all about that if i um i i didn't go back and read the premise after i finished the book i only read it uh in the middle of it for some reason but it says something about collective consciousness in the description okay. so i'm guessing it might be doing that and the third one is about Mary Gay and William on Middle Finger and some other war that's probably happening. It is called Forever Free, though, so I think we'll get an even bigger bow tie at the end. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but if you go off reading every books that are shoot-offs of the first series, we'll never make 15 years, Varsha. It's never going to happen. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These will be side quests. We are still doing the master work one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> um. okay yeah if you guys want to read that i'm i'm down for reading it together but we'll still keep the one a month schedule for the sf masterworks <laughs> until we pick up enough see we can take a break <laughs> for, for finishing some <laughs> yeah um cool anything else to, <laughs> that we should talk about <laughs> No, I've got lots of little things, like little notices, but like in general, the big, the big stuff has has been discussed and yeah, like yeah, cool. Then I guess we're ready to do outros. <laughs> Jared, would you like to start us off? 
Uh, well, thank you for uh, letting me like this book a little more than I originally did. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'm Jared. I have the uh, the Fantasy Thinker YouTube channel, and um, I'm also uh, like to discuss stuff like this on uh, with you with friends here on Page Chewing. And uh, I also forgot to mention I I am doing a little blog every week on uh, the Page oh, right, so yeah. dot com. Yeah. Um, so I always forget to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's it for me. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was great fun. Uh, looking forward, uh, well, the next one. It's going to be I Am Legend, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. It's the next book uh, in the series. Legend, yeah. yes. Don't need to read that one. It's already done. So, yeah. Cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, this has been great. Um, if you want to check my channel, Den of the Weird, or you can find me anywhere online as Chronodendron. Yeah, thank you. This was even better than advertised. Like, I was positively giddy for the past couple of days, thinking, oh, I cannot wait to discuss this book. I just cannot, cannot wait. Um, and it was even better than advertised. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for that. Uh, if you want to find me, you can find me at my channel, which is my name, Chris Moon, M-O-H-A-N, or you can find me at Page Tune Forums, uh, or on probably somebody else on this lovely calls channel. <laughs> Yes, I had great fun with this. Sorry to drop in and out. Um, but uh, yeah, I can be found on Twitter, uh, Page Truing Forums. And um, just uh, looking forward to the next one. Yes. Yes. And thank you so much for watching. We, uh, like everybody here said, you can find us on the Page Truing Forum. If you would like to read the series with us or just pick and choose over the next 15 years, uh, any books from the SF Master Works. <laughs> uh, you can, you can uh, see the scheduling information on the Page Truing Forum. Um, yeah, we'll see everyone again for a discussion of I Am Legend in about a month from now. Thank you so much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.